I am. Hello, welcome to Image Bearers. My name is Atoma Eji. I'm very excited to have on the program today, Dr. Matt Bates. He is the award-winning author and professor of theology at uh, Quincy University in Quincy, Illinois. His popular books include Gospel Allegiance 2019, Salvation by Allegiance 2017, and Birth of the Trinity in 2015. He also co-founded and co-hosts On Script Podcast. Welcome, welcome, welcome to the program. Hey, thanks, Atoma. Thanks, Michael. It's good to have you here. Although, let me jump in, Atoma. When you say award-winning, you got to kind of explain that. Like, are we talking an Oscar or an Emmy or a uh, Pulitzer? What, what kind of awards are we talking here? Yeah, why don't you share, uh, Dr. Bates, what, uh, what awards did uh, some of your books receive? Uh, well, uh, Salvation by Allegiance alone uh, was the Jesus Creed uh, book of the year for that year. And uh, it wow. was listed as best book for a couple other theology websites and whatnot. So, um, yeah. Well, that's much better than the Oscar. So there you oh, go. <laughs> well, you know, I'm surprised that Hollywood hasn't called me yet. Um, I'm, I'm still waiting, but, um, you know, uh, yeah. That'd be, get a whole, get that'd a be an interesting soon. book to transfer into a screenplay. Yeah. <laughs> fascinating <laughs> well you know actually you could do that you could uh, start out the movie where someone believes that salvation is just uh you know the salvation that we always have heard about incorrectly and through through the script the guy learns that it's not that's not the case and and so forth this one here is your most recent one which is uh the gospel the gospel precisely which is what we're going to talk about today and I know this one's actually been on top of the charts also on Amazon, correct? Uh, it's it's doing well out the gate. I mean, it's only been out for what, like maybe two weeks, I guess, at this point. Uh, but yeah, I think um, we're, I'm happy. The press is happy with uh, early returns on it. Um, but it, it's a book that's mainly meant to succeed, not by individuals finding it and reading it. I mean, that's important, but but mainly like pastors and leaders opting to use it for groups because it's really oriented for group study. Um, it's, it's really intended like, okay, I run a small group. Like I want, I want people in my small group to, you know, to, to learn more about like how to articulate the gospel, it's true boundaries, um, and, uh, to think really carefully about the gospel and then church-wide studies. There's a number of churches actually who are opting to use it for, um, a church-wide study. Um, so that's been exciting for me to see already. There's a couple churches that have already said they're going to do it for a church-wide study. So I love that getting it in the pews. That's, uh, that's why I wrote it. I wrote it, you know, I didn't write it for my health. I, I wrote it because I, I want the everyday Christian to encounter it. Yeah. Well, actually you started kind of answering our questions already. So we're kind of diving right in. Um, also on the podcast today, we have uh, Michael Burns, who's a great friend of mine, who's written also a number of books and has also been influenced by your work. So thank you again, Michael, for joining the podcast today. Good to be here. All right, we're going to go ahead and start out with the uh, first question. And uh, you started answering this one a little bit already, but uh, if you like, you can, you can definitely expound upon it. So uh, you've written, again, two other books that we I just uh, shared about. And what led you to write this additional volume, which, again, in this case, is the Gospel Precisely? What led you to write this book? Well, Salvation by Allegiance Alone was published by Baker Academic. And the academic part... Um, says something about its intended audience and location. Um, you know, um, books that have an academic imprint is what that's called, are, are usually oriented more toward um, influencing other professors, influencing pastors who have a more academic bent. Uh, and you're really trying to feed into the stream of ideas and so that other researchers can encounter it and, and, and other professionals. Um, and, uh, I was fortunate with that book to have a fair bit of crossover success into a popular audience. Um, and that was exciting for me. And I think the press was really pleased with it. Um, and so that uh, parlayed into another opportunity with the same press, uh, but it's under a different imprint, uh, that, that book Gospel Allegiance that came out with uh, Brazos, 
was intended to be a, a more accessible um, but more focused study of these questions. And so salvation by allegiance alone is kind of more wide ranging um, kind of theology of salvation. How does it all work? I mean, I deal with the gospel, but briefly. And so in gospel allegiance, I really kind of hunkered down on the gospel and said, let's get down to brass tacks and let's try to, um, to articulate the gospel in a, in a more exacting way. And once we do that, um, that raises questions about grace. Like how does grace work? Uh, how does, how is this not a violation mm -hmm. of grace? Uh, how, if faith is understood more in an allegiance direction, is that not a violation of, of grace, right? How does this work? How does this interface with works? Um, so I'm trying to nuance all that in gospel allegiance. Um, and my hope was that might be usable for church studies and for things like that. Um, and I think it, it has been. I mean, there are churches that have done studies with it and successfully, but there's two problems with it for a church-based study. One, and the big problem is it's just flat out too long. Um, it's 70,000 words, which is pretty normal for an academic-ish book. Um, but, you know, for people who are your everyday churchgoer, they, they need something a little, um, a little uh, more slender and uh, a little more, um, yeah, snappy in order to be able to get through it. Um, so, uh, yeah, the gospel precisely has like sh really short chapters. I think it's like uh, like 2,500 words. The whole book is, you know, only 13,000 words. It's uh, even though it's 100 pages, it's got a generous typesetting and you can breeze right through it uh, pretty quickly for um, yeah a group study. Uh, so it's 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 much, much better lengthwise for a group study. And and that really was my heart is I really want this to get out into the churches. The other thing about gospel allegiance is that you know, for me as a scholar, I'm really comfortable naming other people who are getting ideas wrong. That's what scholars do. We, you know, we critique one another's ideas and that's just part of the culture. Um, but some people are not comfortable with that in churches. That's not really church culture. Like you don't do much of that in like a popular pastoral book. You're not going to be like, well, John Piper's getting it wrong or, you know, so-and-so is getting it wrong. Uh, but in gospel allegiance, I did some of that. I, I, I named some names saying that, the way that the, that these different thinkers have been articulating the gospel, although they're getting many things right, they're actually getting some important things wrong. And I named names, and I, like John Piper was one of the names I named. R. C. Sproul saying, "I appreciate these guys, appreciate their ministries, um, but they're actually misarticulating the center and the framework of the gospel." And that's a big claim, uh, but I think I backed that claim up uh, pretty effectively in the book, um, and uh, and that stirred conversation. The problem, though, with using that in a church context is nobody wants to split their church, right? Uh, you, you're using that in a group study and somebody's like really a huge Piper fan and, and rightly so, Piper's a good guy, right? Um, then uh, then all of a sudden they're, they're, they're feeling heated because somebody who's their hero is being critiqued and and then it, it could cause, you know, bad feelings could emerge. So um, I wanted to have a book that didn't name any names, but presented some of the same ideas uh, and did so in a crisper way. Yeah, I, I, I read, as I mentioned, uh, both of your other books on the gospel, and then reading this, and I thought, ah, oh, he's probably just going to, you know, condense uh, some of his thoughts, and I mean, it's still going to be good, but when I read through it, I really liked it, because you emphasize a lot more on glory yeah. and uh, image bearers, which is, this is, that's the name of this podcast, so I, yeah. I really like that uh, aspect in a great way. Yeah, thanks. That's, that's actually true. I mean, it's not just a regurgitation or condensation of my other work. I do significant new work on glory in particular. Yeah. Yeah. I think you got that from, uh, like, Wu, I think I had heard. Yeah, you got some insight from yeah certainly some i mean to be 100 percent honest like as a scholar like uh, i was already familiar with a lot of those ideas through my own encounters with scripture and you know and Wu has a, a helpful articulation but nothing that appeared in this book was really dependent on Wu. but i would say like if you were to want to go deeper then I take you here, like Wu takes me deeper than I could have taken myself, right? Um, as uh, as he has a very uh, good articulation. Uh, Jackson Wu's book, uh, Reading Romans uh, with Eastern Eyes, has a, a fantastic assessment of of honor, shame, culture, of, of how that connects to um, the topic of glory in the book of Romans, how there's been a tendency to misread Romans because glory has been associated with heaven uh, Wait, rather so than with image Romans bearing. Road is not right? Uh, no, it's 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 uh, it's got some truth, but not not right in the in the way that a lot of people think it is. Um, but uh, yeah, Wu is good. Also, um, if I could shout, make it give another shout out, um, uh, uh, Haley uh, Gorenson Jacob, uh, her book, uh, which is called um, "Conform to the Image of the Sun." Yeah. I think I have it somewhere. I 
I, I, I could I could bring it up for you, but I'm not sure where it is. Um, but that's an excellent work too. And she does uh, some fantastic work on glory. And I, I think actually Wu draws on some of her work. Um, so I'll give a shout out to uh, to Haley's work as well too. Yeah, I know all those three books are on my list, uh, especially yeah. the last one. I think Romans 8, I think is going to be very interesting to- Yeah, I, I'll, I'll, I'll have to say, um, I when I read Wu's book, um, I, I, I learned a lot I learned a lot from that book and um, you know, I read a lot in my own field and um, yeah, there are times where you read a lot and you only get like one or two gems and you're like, yeah, okay, I learned something cool there. Right. But there was a lot of pages to get through before I learned something cool. I learned a lot of new things in Wu's book. It was really worthwhile. Mm -hmm. Okay. So uh, speaking of the gospel, how would you define the gospel and how do you feel it's been incorrectly taught? Yeah, I would, I would start by trying to define the gospel, I think, the way that I would see Scripture defining it. So in the New Testament, especially when there's an attempt to summarize uh, what the apostles were doing, uh, when it summarizes their gospel activity, like in Acts 5.42, for instance, uh, it's talking about the characteristic activity of the apostles, and it says they went out gospeling that Jesus is the Christ, or the Christ is Jesus, right? And so when it speaks about them going out and gospeling, and it's talking about their characteristic activity, um, really the gospel was summarized simply by saying Jesus is the Christ. And uh, this is a point of confusion that has crept into our culture because we sing songs like In Christ Alone and things like that. And so we've kind of come into this easy um, equation between Jesus and Christ. We kind of think like, well, they're just like, like Jesus Christ is like his first and last name, or that like when I say Jesus and I, I it means the same thing as Christ and vice versa. But that's not true. It would be um, as if like, um, you know, if you have uh, your uh, a pastor named Steve, right, uh, and uh, it would be like saying that pastor means the same thing as Steve, right? <laughs> like, I mean, like on the one hand, one is like a, a, a job title and has to do with like a job description, pastor, and the other has to do with like, like his given name, right, which would be Steve, right? Mm -hmm. Similarly, it's Jesus is, is, is sort of like more like a given name, right? Um, but the Christ part is an honorific title. It means the king. But we've, we've lost sight of that. And in losing sight of that, we've lost sight of the royal gospel. Yeah, wow, wow. I, I'll tell you, I, I was reading, I'm not really an academician. I, I pretend to be one in my day job. No, just kidding. But uh, I, I, I remember reading through um, Salvation by Allegiance Alone. I was in an airport and I was just like, it was just like ping, ping, ping. Just all the things that you had mentioned. I was just like, wow, this is... This is just amazing. And again, you know, I, I have read descriptions and I just was like, there's something off here with the way some things are taught versus what I'm seeing, you know, in the scriptures. So thank you. Thank you. Oh, um, thank you. I'm encouraged. Yeah. So in the uh, Gospel of Allegiance and also in the Gospel of Precisely, you mentioned uh, 10 events in the life of Jesus. Can you briefly share about those gospel events? And I know one of them is a climax. So if you could maybe share about that specifically. Yeah. Yeah. So if I was to be really exacting, I, I think we, you know, we want to have short hands to summarize the gospel quickly. And I think like the, the New Testament does that. And when they do, they say Jesus is the Christ, right? That's their quick summary. Um, and I, I like to expand that just a, just a hair and say Jesus is the saving king and, you know, kind of use that king language rather than Christ or Jesus is the liberating king or Jesus is the healing king, I'll say sometimes. But yeah, but we need to expand beyond that because the New Testament says that other things are gospel too, right? And so really, as the New Testament's articulating uh, different events that uh, form that together form the whole gospel, uh, I identify 10 that the New Testament repeatedly says are gospel, right? You could find different places in the New Testament where all 10 events are said to be gospel and more than once. And that's why I, I landed on these as my 10 events. So the first is that Jesus pre-existed with God the Father. Um, and, and so this is just affirming that Jesus is, uh, in, in, in some sense, right, the Logos, who is the Son of God, uh, who pre-existed before he became the human Jesus. Now, I say Jesus pre-existed, but he didn't even have a human nature at that point, right? He assumes a human nature in the incarnation. Uh, and the incarnation is the second event, right? As the Bible talks about this Jesus coming into being in the line of David. Uh, and so that God had made these promises to David, um, and these promises involved an eternal throne, 
So as Jesus is born uh, into the line of David, right, this is the son of God taking on human flesh and doing so in the line of David as a fulfillment of promise. So we would want to say the incarnation, like Jesus' enfleshment, right, that's actually gospel, uh, part of the gospel, a key gospel event. A third, then, that Jesus died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. Um, and so this here is uh, what most people would identify as the gospel, right? They would say, well, what's at the, what's at the heart of the gospel? They would say the cross, or the cross is at the heart of the gospel. And, and, and God forbid that we ever, like, forget about the cross, right? I mean, the cross is enormously important to the gospel. And the idea of Jesus uh, or, or the Christ dying for our sins, right, is very foundational. And it's linked to the Old Testament here, right? That it's in accordance with the Old Testament scriptures. So this here is, involves the idea that Jesus... Um, wasn't just coming willy-nilly, right? Um, but this was according to God's plan and that God was bringing certain things to fulfillment. Uh, and then, uh, of course, after he dies for our sins, uh, he's buried. Uh, and this affirms the reality of his death. His death was real, right? And then he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. So not only Jesus, uh, the suffering of the Christ, the Messiah, but also uh, the Messiah's uh, resurrection life is something that was anticipated in the Old Testament. Uh, and then once he was raised, he was seen. He appeared to many witnesses, right, who, who said, hey, I saw him in a physical body raised from the dead. Uh, but after that, we get to the climax of the gospel, right? Um, and I identify this as the climax of the gospel because I'm pretty sure the New Testament does as I read through the New Testament, right? As we read through especially the apostles' speeches as they're presenting the gospel in Acts, they land the energy on the climax of Jesus' enthronement. Right. So, for, for example, think of Peter's Pentecost speech, right? The Holy Spirit's poured out on the community. Peter stands up and begins to preach. And, and he preaches this whole sermon involving most of these events I just mentioned. Uh, but the last thing he says, kind of the climactic thing before he calls people to respond, is that God has made this Jesus both Lord and Christ right? God has made this Jesus uh, the, the Lord and the King. He kind of doubles down on it in his climactic energy, wanting people to see that that's really central uh, or really a climactic moment to the gospel. Um, and so that's why I say it's the, it's the climax of the gospel, because although the cross is the climax in one sense, as that's maybe like the, the sharpest part of the story where the agony is experienced, on the other hand, it's not the final victory that the New Testament wants to emphasize of Jesus's enthronement at the right hand of God, where he then begins to rule. So then Jesus rules at the right hand of God and will come again. Um, so as we look at the whole of the gospel, I think I got all 10 in there. I don't have any notes in front of me, uh, but that would be what I would consider to be a full expression of the gospel in the New Testament. Yeah, no, I, and I know you went through them really quickly, but yeah, that, I think that just was amazing when I went through, I think the first time, I think you had done eight at the time. That's in right. salvation by allegiance alone, and then kind of expanded it or refined it or so. Yeah, and that was mainly because as I reflected on it, and, and actually feedback from um, readers too, um, helped me to realize like, you know, I need to say something about the Spirit. As obviously I knew the Spirit was involved, but I, as I read through, like for instance, Romans 1, uh, 4, where it talks about um, Jesus uh, being appointed Son of God in power, and then it says, it, you know, and it says, as it pertains to the Spirit of holiness, Right. So clearly the spirit, right, is functionally what makes Jesus's rule or Jesus's reign operative. So seeing the spirit's function, right, as as being um, uh, a key component of the gospel and the spirit is what applies the gospel's benefits to our lives. I wanted to make sure I got the spirit in there. Um, and then we also see the Trinitarian structure of the gospel more clearly, too, as the father sends the son so they can both send the spirit. OK. Now, I know I had a kind of a second part to one of my questions about how the gospel is incorrectly taught. And I think as we uh, look at the response to the gospel, maybe if you can also share a little bit more about how the gospel is incorrectly taught from your study of scripture. Uh, and then the second part to that would be um, uh, basically the response to the gospel. What would a correct response be to the gospel? Okay, yeah, so the first part of the question, I mean, there's lots of ways the Gospels are taught wrongly, some of them horrendously wrong, right, like with the health and wealth gospel garbage. Um, uh, or, but, but, or like uh, David wrote the Sermon on the Mount? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, the, the, I saw that uh, on Twitter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There was uh, a friend on Twitter who was, whose yeah, book had got a negative review because he didn't say that David wrote the Sermon on the Mount. Or, <laughs> <laughs> it's like, King David, the Sermon on the Mount? Are <laughs> you... Uh, I think you need to rethink your, uh, yeah, anyway. Yeah, so, wow. uh, 
yeah, that, that was a, that was a new one uh, for me, a new, a new heresy uh, to, to, to see that uh, anyone could even think that. Uh, but uh, yeah, so um, wrong ways to present the gospel, I think, um, have mainly happened because people really want other people to believe the gospel. They really want people to embrace Jesus. And because as part of that, they're, they've, they've become convinced that the cross is really what it's all about. And so as a, as a way of simplifying, um, the gospel was simplified down to what happened on the cross rather than its full narrative, right, as we find it in Scripture. And that, like, what really you need to do is get people to respond to that. They need to trust that Jesus really died for their sins. And so however you can get people to make that move, uh, that's what you need to do so that they can be saved. So it became kind of like a used car sales pitch, right? Like, let me tell you about this car, right? Like, well, God, you know, made creation good. And then, uh, you know, that it fell into disrepair, but, but then, you know, the good news, like through Jesus's substitution, everything's running good again, as long as you trust it, or you just got to trust the atonement works for you, that Jesus really did die uh, and for your sins and that your sins are covered. And if you trust him fully, then uh, you're on your way to heaven, right? That's the way the gospel was uh, kind of reduced, I would say, um, within a lot of um, popular culture. Um, and the problem with that is, of course, it doesn't deal with the gospel's fullness in any kind of way, but it also really distorts what it means to respond to the gospel. Um, because when, once we realize that the gospel is about how Jesus became king, right, and of course it's a cross and resurrection-shaped process by which he becomes king, but once we realize that it's about how he became king, we realize that what faith means is something bigger, and that faith doesn't mean just trusting that the atonement somehow covers me, it means responding to his kingship also, so that we, we come to understand that faith means also faithfulness or loyalty or fidelity. And once we begin to think in those directions, we can actually do the research and say, does faith really mean that? The Greek word pistis, like, was it used in that way uh, in the New Testament time period? Was it used that way in the New Testament? And the answer is clearly yes. Clearly, we can demonstrate that faith means faithfulness frequently. Uh, and means loyalty, means allegiance. It, 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 it has that range of meaning so that it means both trust and means loyalty. Uh, and so we have to have that holistic response where we're, we have a trusting loyalty in Jesus as King. Would you say that Acts 2, probably from like 38 to 42, encompasses the response to the gospel? Or what, what would you say? Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't have that passage like in front of me or off the top of my head, right? But after Peter preaches at Pentecost, right, he he calls people to you know repent and to be baptized, right? Um, I don't remember if he uses faith language in that passage or not. Without looking back, um, but certainly throughout the New Testament, if we were to look, the most common call is to you know is to a, a faith response to Jesus. Um, yeah, and I, and interestingly, baptism is something that has become a point of controversy in the church, as there are different baptismal traditions. Um, but, but it's interesting, like those sacramental traditions, right, that are, um, are quite rigid in some denominations, um, you know, whether they be Catholic or Orthodox or Lutherans or whoever it might be who practice, you know, certain infant baptisms or whatever it might be, and who have a high view of what are called the sacraments, uh, the Greek word sacrament, I mean, the Latin word sacramentum um, is actually like where we get our English word sacrament from, and it actually means oath. Um, and so what was going on was actually as part of baptism, people were swearing their allegiance to Jesus as king. What you did when you got baptized was you professed Jesus to be your king, and then you were baptized because you'd responded to the gospel of Jesus's kingship. So baptism wasn't separated from allegiance, but was part of it, right? It was all bound together. Your declaration of allegiance to the king was part of what it meant to get baptized, yeah, so um, I'm going to uh, hand it over to my good friend, Michael Burns, but I would recommend, again, and we're going to go through this. We, we're not done yet, but I would start with this one. This is kind of like the tip of the iceberg, along with obviously reading your scriptures, and then I go a little bit deeper with this one, and then you can definitely get a little bit more with this one. So thank you. I'll hand it over to Mike. Thanks, Otama. Yeah. Yeah, appreciate it. Uh, Atoma, I think, is uh, working to become your your new manager. Uh, yeah, uh, <laughs> seriously. I, yeah, yeah, I could use a publicist. Uh, you know, was... there you go. Hey, I want to. I, I appreciate your answers, and I, I want to drill down on a couple of these things, uh, maybe a little more, and give you a chance to talk about these things. Is um, you know, in uh, I'll say recapturing 
some of the biblical heart behind the language of of kingship and allegiance and some of those things. That's uh, not, uh, I think it's safe to assume, the most common way of thinking or expressing the gospel in modern American Christianity. And you've talked a little bit about how we got there to that point, and uh, that makes a lot of sense. But what structural impact has that, uh, you know, sort of straying from the, the kingship model? What, what impact has that had on structural Christianity in America, oh, do you think? Yeah, just an enormously negative structural impact. I mean, when we deviate from the truth, especially the gospel, right, um, uh, even if it's unintentional and even if it's, a, a, you know, a slow drift, right, um, there are huge problems that develop. And the huge problem that developed was what we would call the development of a transactional structure uh, to um, how the gospel was understood and people were engaging Christianity. Um, they, you know, especially in the era dominated by the Billy Graham crusade, you know, kind of um, approach, um, like for all the good he did, which was a doubtless lot, um, th there could also be problems that develop as uh, the way the gospel was understood, right, was that like, all you need to do is trust that Jesus died for your sins, and then you're good to go. Right. Well, then what ongoing need is there for discipleship? Like, well, it's optional. Like, well, don't you love your Lord? Might be the appeal. Like, well, if you do, like, we should like proceed to do some good deeds and, you know, and like make some progress in sanctification or uh, however it might be framed, right? Uh, as an expression of your love for the Lord, it should overflow into those areas. Um, but, uh, that was that was seen as icing on the cake. It was just it was it was something that was not part of the built-in structure of Christianity. So there was not a lot of emphasis on discipleship, right? And so like discipleship programs weakened and weakened and weakened and weakened and weakened until um, then some churches they were non-existent. All it means is like getting a few people saved and getting them to a rally so they can confess Jesus as Lord and uh, and then they're on their way to heaven. So um, like, yeah, okay, we should try to encourage them to be disciples too. But like, there's another rally next week, maybe we should cast our energy there rather than on building a discipleship program, right? But if discipleship is the path to salvation, right, if, if what it means to give my allegiance to Jesus as King is not just a transaction, but that I'm, 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 I'm actually intending to be formed into his image, Right, and that's actually necessary for my salvation. Right, to to have an ongoing posture of loyalty to Him, where I'm in my life saying, "I give allegiance to you." Not, it's, it's never going to be a perfect allegiance, any more than a perfect faith. That's traditionally understood, but it's going to be an imperfect allegiance that I keep trying to to intend toward Jesus. Right, I'm on the road to discipleship. I, I have to try to embrace His rule over my life. Hmm. So yeah, I would say that the, the the impact has been. Um, the devastation of discipleship, and we're fortunately in a period of recovery now. Uh, and I think that um, an allegiance model, A, because it's true, but B, because it's also um, highly practical, is exactly what the church needs right now. I, I appreciate that. And, you know, from what I see, I see a lot of scholars, uh, pastors, theologians, uh, coming along with you on this and, and really adding uh, to uh, their voice in agreement. And, and I, I see it more and more in the language of books and, and this sort of thing. And so that has to be encouraging, but oh, also absolutely. you're, you're, you know, you're, you're taking on some sacred cows here and Christians have a tendency to fight sometimes about some of the dumbest things and, and the gospel itself, when you're kind of, uh, recasting ca what the gospel is biblically, uh, I would imagine you're going to have some pushback. Have Have you had some pushback on that? And um, how, how have you taken that? What has been kind of your response to that? Yeah, there has been some pushback, both at the scholarly level and the popular level. But the scholarly pushback has actually been really thin. There was just maybe one journal article published that <laughs> tried to offer a critique. Uh, there were a couple um, points raised that, um, yeah, like uh, things I needed to think through. But um, yeah, by, by and large, I think that um, the critique mostly missed the mark. And I think the rest of the scholarly community tends to agree that the critique missed its mark. I, there's not been a lot of rallying behind that critique. Um, and, uh, and I think I answer some of the critique in a subsequent article, even if it's indirectly. Um, and I don't really want to get into the scholarly minutiae here, but it sure. would have to do with um, 
theories of how words mean things in general, right? And um, and some complexities around some of that. Um, and uh, I think I, I I hope that I've answered uh, critics on a scholarly level. But truthfully, the, there hasn't been a lot of pushback, a lot more affirmation. Um, on a more popular level, there was a, a sort of a debate about that kind of turned quite public uh, through social media uh, between G Greg Gilbert and myself and Scott McKnight. And Greg Gilbert had uh, in a, um, a T4G meeting, um, he was the, one of the main speakers on the floor and uh, he was uh, preaching, you know, on uh, something along the lines of the gospel. I don't remember his topic specifically, um, but he he began by critiquing Scott and I for saying that we divorce uh, like personal salvation from the gospel or something like that. And so Scott and I um, took umbrage with that. We didn't agree that uh, that accurately represented uh, in the least uh, what we had done um, and was, in fact, um, yeah, quite slanderous, uh, we felt. Um, so uh, we uh, we proceeded to engage in dialogue with Greg Gilbert. And um, so, yeah, there's that if, if you want to go back and look at the Christianity Today correspondence uh, back and forth. Uh, but but I think, um, yeah, if I could if I could cut to the chase, I think that the, the problem that uh, that Greg Gilbert uh, or the error that he makes would be um, to misunderstand how justification fits into salvation, that it's actually a benefit of the gospel and that Jesus provides benefits for, for all people, right? But that we access those benefits individually and personally as we give our allegiance to him, right? And so that our justification is not intrinsic to the gospel. Like you, Michael Burns, your justification is not part of the gospel, nor is mine. But the community's justification has been won by Jesus's actions, and your justification um, happens whenever you give your loyalty to Jesus and you are incorporated into that community um, of the saved. So you get incorporated into the community of the justified as it's a benefit that flows from the gospel. So um, it has to do with whether or not justification is intrinsic to the gospel or a benefit of the gospel and individual versus corporate understandings of how salvation interfaces uh, with the gospel. That's excellent. I, I will take umbrage though with the fact that I've I've always thought that my personal salvation was uh, part of the gospel. No one else's, just mine. <laughs> just yours. Just, just yours. mine. Um, yeah. But no, you're really talking, I think about, uh, you know, Romans 1 sort of 16 there then as well, that it's the, the power of the gospel rather than the gospel itself. That's right. Yeah, and the uh, gospel I, reveals, yeah, like in the gospel yep. reveals the righteousness of God is actually what Romans 1 17 says. So that in the gospel, the righteousness of God. So it talks about justification being revealed in the gospel, but it doesn't equate justification in the gospel. So yeah, it, it, it would position us to see both because of the power release and because of that, that, that revealed language that we would better understand justification as a benefit of the gospel. Just Justification by faith is true, right? Once faith is understood, mm -hmm. once justification is properly understood. Um, but yeah, to, to say that it is the center of the gospel, um, which is what Greg Gilbert and others were saying, um, misidentifies the framework of the gospel, which is Jesus's kingship. That's, that's, the, that's what, should, what should get our climactic energy. Yeah. Right. Um, and someone will say, well, we preach Christ crucified. And I say, well, don't forget the Christ part. Right? <laughs> that means that means the king, right? We, right. Pre we preach the king. The king's already assumed when Paul talks about the crucified right there, right? Yeah, that's fantastic. And I, and I know I personally benefited in my own thought and, and writing and leaning on some of these ideas that you presented. And so I, I think it's actually encouraging when some of the main pushback against you is kind of is a straw man in, in many respects. And so I, I appreciate you being able to answer that. Um, let, let me stay on this a little bit here in this sort of corporate way of, of thinking and, and maybe ask a, a practical question here in a corporate level, if we're thinking, okay, a church has embraced what, what you're teaching and they, you know, they get the gospel precisely and they go through uh, this book uh, together how is this church going to live and look differently perhaps than a church that ha is still em embracing some of the maybe older ways of expressing uh, these thoughts? Yeah, I would say that there's an increased precision, <coughs> excuse me, an increased precision about what the problem is and what the answer is. Um, the problem isn't just that Adam and Eve sinned, right? Okay. The problem is that 
Adam and Eve ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, right? And in so doing, they took moral authority and moral autonomy on themselves, and they took upon themselves the decision to decide what's right and wrong for themselves. They decided to become king of their own life with regard to what's right and wrong. And I'd say that's the fundamental human problem. Right. It's it's more precise than just to say that the fundamental problem is sin. The fundamental problem is that sin looks like this. It looks like not giving God kingship over good and evil. Right. It means us redefining good and evil in ways that satisfy our own bodily appetites or our greed. And so that we become king of our own life and over our own society. And we begin to construct um, faulty ideas about what will cause human flourishing right, um, around our own definitions of good and evil. A church that's embracing Jesus as king says Jesus's way of being king, right, is the fundamental expression about what God wants humans to be. Like, this is what it looks like for humans to be human, right, as God intended. And, they begin, and they're pursuing that very actively, saying, um, I, don't want, I don't just want your forgiveness, Jesus. I want to look like you. I want to bear your image. I want, I want your glory, the glory of God, to be manifest in a local place because I'm now reflecting your image, and my image is no longer shattered and degraded and broken, but my image is now being reconstructed around the image of the Son of God. And now when people look at my life and they look at what's happening in my sphere of influence, they see God's glory. That's what it, that's the difference. And that's what it looks like. And uh, a transactional kind of church, um, they're not deeply invested in that. They, they're more invested in like getting people saved and like maybe getting some butts in the pew in terms of church growth. Um, uh, and they're seeker friendly because they just want to get people saved. And the idea is like, okay, if we could just get people saved, if we get them to pray this prayer, then they're going to start living this holy life. But they don't really realize that like praying the prayer, asking Jesus to, to cover my, my sins is not actually the full response to the gospel, right? They actually haven't fully responded to the gospel yet. The full response involves an acknowledgement of Jesus's kingship and a submission to his authority. So that's really what we need to do. And then the Holy Spirit comes, right? As we, as we say, Jesus is king, right? The Holy Spirit comes, right? Um, and then our sins are forgiven. Um, but it's sort of a, yeah, it, 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 it I think it, it, it misses out on um, a full orbed discipleship uh, image bearing uh, kind of response. Mm, that's great. Let, let me flip this around um, just a little bit here and say, uh, and, and this may be a little bit of a difficult question to answer because it's going to be a situational question, but just in general terms, um, let's say I, I've read Matthew Bates's books. I love them, but I go to a church that hasn't really em embraced it, is not there yet um, for, for whatever reason. They're unaware or just, you know, doesn't ring true and doesn't put more butts in the seats on Sunday. So um, how do I respond to that as, as an individual Christian? Like, how can I uh, respond in my church? Because this seems like not that you can embrace this as an individual, but it's it's really a, a sort of a more corporate um, truth and mindset. So so what do I do if I'm part of a church that just is not quite seeing this yet? I would yeah, I would keep pressing on the Jesus is King part. You know, it's simple, right? And just say that you know, as as people are talking about the gospel, just kind of raise the question like, how does Jesus's kingship fit into this? Right. Like you're, you're talking about the gospel, but like but we know that th we know that the gospel involves Jesus as king. Right. Just keep sticking it in there. And so that people are like having to ponder. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Jesus is Lord. Right. Um, and they say like, you know, Jesus is Savior and Lord. Right. But then say like, but how is this really like, OK, you're, you're, I think we're doing OK on the Savior part. But how do the Savior and the Lord really come together here? Right. We, we got to hold them together and to kind of push in that direction. Um, and, you know, and I think that as you, um, you know, as somebody who would embrace the gospel allegiance model, I think hopefully um, you've got a lot of um, scriptural resources at your disposal where you could take people to texts and say like, look, the gospel of Jesus is the king. We've got to make this at the, we've got to put this at the forefront of what we're saying about the gospel, not in, not, not giving it a back seat. Like, okay, Jesus died for your sins. Oh yeah. And he's the Lord too, like of your heart. I, I 
like whatever that means, I guess, <laughs> right? Um, all kinds of damage has been done by people thinking that the devil's in control of the world or something like that. Mm. Like, you know, um, and we need to realize the devil has very limited purview and authority, right? That really, whenever Jesus has become enthroned as the king, like he sits down at God's right hand as the ruler of heaven and earth, both divine and human, right? And he is now ruling creation. When Jesus says that my kingdom is not from this world or of this world in the gospel of John chapter 17, he uses the Greek word ak, which has to do with source or origin. Or he's saying that my kingdom doesn't derive its source or its origin from this world. He's not saying that he's not becoming the king of the world, right? Um, and we've misunderstood that. And because of that, we've, we've misunderstood the gospel and responded very badly to it so that we see we think that the gospel is not political at all or that it has, doesn't have a social reality or that Jesus is king of my heart, but not over the world or some nonsense like that. We need that holistic recovery. We need it bad. Mm. Uh, well said. I, I appreciate that. And, and one other thought here, just a, a little one, is I, I know N.T. Wright in some of his translations has gone – just flat out to translating Christ as King Jesus. Yeah. Uh, do, do you like that, or do you do. think there's yeah. an inheritance in keeping the word well, Christ? Well, we we have to. I mean, we have to be able to explain what kind of king he is, right? That like that Messiah is a richer term, right? That it that it meant a certain kind of king who would come in the line of David. You know, and that Israel had a tr tradition of anointed kingships, and that was connected to anointing for holy service in general, because priests were also anointed. I mean, we have to be able to unpack that for people at the right time. But for a, for a quick equivalent to our culture that people can immediately get, King Jesus, I'm all in. I mean, there's, there's no reason not to use that language. Um, it, it really helps people to move away from like treating Christ as just a personal name. Um, and uh, I mean, qu quite honestly, some of the most damaging things that are reinforced for us are our songs, which I love our, our old hymns and our songs, but but the tendency to, to slide Christ into an equivalent to Jesus in those songs like has an enormous sway over the church uh, in ways that they don't even think about. They just sort of imbibe it week after week. And as a pastor, we really need to be doing, pastors really need to be doing the job of saying, like, that's a great song. We love it. And by the way, when we say it, when we say in Christ, we mean in the king, right? We don't just mean in Jesus. Jesus is the king, but we mean in the king. And that there's a royal dimension to what's going on here that we cannot lose sight of. That's a pastoral task because we can't lose those songs either. They're too good. Yeah. Right? We got to have those. We got to have those songs. Yeah. <laughs> that it's well said and, and so important uh, what you're saying and what you've written. And I really appreciate it and the impact uh, that I think you have had and will continue to have on uh, modern uh, Christianity, quite frankly, I, I think it's a profound impact. And so I really appreciate uh, what you have written. Uh, how, how can people find out more about you and your ministry? Obviously, we've mentioned the books. Uh, if I'm listening, and I'm like, I like this Matt Bates guy, I want more. Uh, how can I get more of that? Well, thanks, Michael. I appreciate it. Um, yeah, and I just want to like highlight, I'm like not working alone here, right? There's lots of other people doing some more work. Scott McKnight, N.T. Wright, um, Michael Gorman would be somebody mm. I would really strongly encourage people to check out. Joshua Jip uh, doing fantastic work. All A lot of it very, uh, very much along similar lines, I think. So um, I see myself as collaborating uh, with others. I mean, um, maybe the allegiance language is something I've grabbed onto more than other people, but yeah, but, but it's all common work. Right. And I, right. I wouldn't have gotten there without, um, without their work and hopefully they find mine helpful too. Um, if, as far as me personally, um, yeah, like you've already mentioned the books, um, you know, um, I, I, uh, co-host this on script podcast. It's a little more like scholarly, uh, but there's, I think some good things to, you know, to, 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 to do in terms of keeping up with a scholarly conversation. I mean, you can follow me on Twitter if you want. I'm not like super active on Twitter as I, I kind of see it as a necessary evil as an author, <laughs> but I'm occasionally on there. Um, Matthew W. Bates at Matthew W. Bates would be how you'd find me um, or Facebook. Uh, but certainly um, like I, I think connecting with other people is important to me. So like, yeah, I, I like to connect with like-minded people. So yeah, give me a follow and uh, hopefully I'll follow you back if I identify that you're you're trying to follow me and are like-minded and, and we can team up as it's, it's a big partnership, right? As we're all serving together right it's about king jesus uh and uh we need a huge team effort uh to uh to serve him well love it before we let you go 
I know one of the things that you do on, on script is uh, give people a little lightning round question. So Atoma wanted to turn the tables on you oh, and, and do that to you a little yeah. bit. So uh, he's, he's asked me to, to throw this lightning round at you. So I hope you're ready. All right. Well, that's good. And I saw you sent lightning round questions, but I didn't really look at them because I, I thought I'd keep it authentic. Right. And right. So, that's I'm, I'm glad that you have integrity in that. That's uh, uh, that's I good. did glance, but I, I only, <laughs> only remember one or two of them truthfully. So all right. All I'm right. not looking at them right now, at least. All right. So here we go. Uh, what's your favorite type of food? Um, right at the moment, uh, I'm going to go with, uh, I, I mean, I, I would always almost say steak or cherries, but I'm gonna go with asparagus, which I love asparagus. Some people don't like it, but asparagus is fantastic. I am so with you. Steak and asparagus together. Yeah, together. Can't be oh yeah, absolutely. There you go. Um, what's your favorite movie? I'm not a movie guy. Um, so I'll just mention one. Uh, uh, my family and I were just watching is more of like a TV show. Uh, we really loved um, uh, the mysterious Benedict society. I'm watching that with the whole fam. Um, I think it's a new one, Disney plus, and uh, it's just, it's clean, but it's like the, it's just funny and, and, and just delightfully done. So we've All been, right. we've been enjoying mysterious Benedict. I've not even heard of that. So yeah, it's good. Check, check it, it out. out. It's fun. All right. Do, do you have a morning routine? Um, you know, in a semester, sometimes I'll get into a pretty good routine, but I would say truthfully, not really right now. And it's because, um, I teach Tuesday, Thursdays at my university, like long blocks, but then I, I'm not teaching presently Monday, Wednesday, Friday. So my days just look very different. Sometimes I like jog in the morning, like this morning, I got out and slogged out some miles and it's hot and humid and it was brutal. I was so glad to come into my office. Um, uh, no, not a strong, not a strong routine right now. Okay. Uh, when it comes to the Bible, do you prefer paper or digital? Paper. Oh, okay. Fashion. Interesting. Well, All I right. like, uh, for some things, it's nice to have a digital. Like, I like, um, like you know, like automated parsing. Like, when I'm reading Greek, it's fun to have a dictionary that, you know, and a parsing you can just touch sometimes. That's nice. All right. <laughs> do you have a favorite book of the Bible? Uh, either Gospel of John or Romans. Yeah. Okay. Depending on my mood. All right. I'm with you on that. Okay. Uh, who's your favorite Bible character? Oh, well, I mean, Jesus doesn't count. I assume like usually God, it's assumed that Jesus yeah, is in that's his own gotta, category, um, right? Yeah. I mean, I think Jonah is hilarious. So, I mean, <laughs> I don't know, like, um, I mean, he's, I think he's the most intriguing and delightful, like just because he's comic. Um, but uh, if, in terms of someone I admire the apostle Paul, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely a, my, my dissertation work is on the apostle paul's theology and i'm always uh, a huge fan of the apostle paul love him okay outside of the bible do you have a favorite book or author mm, graham green i would say is probably my favorite author um uh favorite book uh, i'll go with uh one i read recently that i just loved over the past year um lee inger's peace like a river phenomenal Hmm. Yeah. I, right. I read a lot of fiction though. I, I could, I could do this. I could do this game all day. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I love, I love to, I love to read, but I, I like to read in my field, but I read a lot of fiction too. Okay. So right, I'll ask you, Mike, uh, the, yeah, last go ahead. Years, the last 50 years. Oh, my, what I think the most important book in the last 50 years is, is that, yes. is it like uh, the, the on script question? Um, yeah, you know, I, I I would have to say I think Jesus and the Victory of God by N.T. Wright is at least for me personally the one that I it, it it's really the best book that's ever been written on Jesus. Um, and uh, it's hard to say that's not just phenomenally important. But yeah, there's there's other there's different kinds of importances, <clears throat> but maybe that one brings together the right flavors for me. It has scholarly importance, but also devotional and personal. So mm. we'll go, we'll go with Jesus and the victory of God by N.T. Wright. You will get no arguments from me on that. Um, if you could live in any city in the world, what would it be? I wouldn't live in a city. Um, <laughs> so uh, I would live in a, a town of about maybe 25,000. And I would probably live uh, about an hour off the Oregon coast, but not in Portland. Um, so uh, yeah, I don't know. Like, okay. uh, you, you get the idea. Maybe Montana too, like maybe like Helena or somewhere like that. I, I, I love Montana too. Interesting. So is that the place you'd most want to visit? Where would you most want to visit in the world? 
Mm. Well, I mean, I've been there lots of times. My family is from Northern California, Oregon. So, um, and my wife's family too. So uh, if I could visit somewhere, I mean, I've never been to Africa and Africa just, you know, when I see documentary films, I like the landscape so stunning. Um, so I would love to sometime visit Africa and it's so diverse too. I mean, um, I think it would just be amazing to see the diversity of animal life and plantation. And uh, I've actually never been out of North America. Oh, wow. Um, so I've never been to Europe either. So I've, there's lots of places I'd like to like to go. Well, you're on with the right guys because a lot of my ministry and time is spent in Africa and oh, Atoma really? is yeah. from Africa. So right. we'll, okay. we'll take you some time. <laughs> Hook, me up. Hook me up, guys. <laughs> Last question from Atoma. He says, if you could place a billboard in the middle of your city, what would it say? Hmm, a billboard. Oh, that's a really a hard one. Um, <laughs> yeah, I don't. You know, images are so powerful and, um, you know, like uh, you guys are image bearers and image transformation. Um, I wonder, you know, if, I, if I'd love to find an, uh, like some sort of icon of somebody who is gazing on Jesus and you can find it like it, because of that, they're transformed. Maybe it wouldn't say anything, mm. but you could see that like that, be, that Jesus in his cross shaped glory has has become imprinted on that person and they're taking on a cross-shaped glory that's allowing them to suffer in a way that's serving, like not just arbitrarily suffer, but like in, in a way that is redemptive for someone else. Maybe I would have an image like that. Oh, that's really good. That's interesting. And, and may I, as I bring this to an end, say you have an impeccable sense of grooming and styling. <laughs> um, Love the bald headed beard look. Thank Can't you. Can't go wrong yeah. with that. Yeah. Well, like God, God, God gave me a bald head and I might as well show it off. Right. That's you right. Know, so. Lean into it, my friend. Lean yeah, into we're it. all, uh, we're all on uh, in one accord, right. Uh, <laughs> just as the early church was in our, um, yeah. Well, I, I we really appreciate your time. Appreciate having you on. Atom, any closing words? Yeah. Are you planning on uh, writing any other books? Uh, I know you just wrote one, so I apologize. But uh, in the near future, any thoughts? Um, or... it, it won't be too near. But yeah, there are two other books under contract. One coming out with Brazos that will follow up to Salvation by Allegiance Alone and Gospel Allegiance and one that will be independent. Um, yeah. I'll, and I'll, I'll keep it under wraps. Uh, yeah, I think the, you did mention topics. that in, in Gospel of Legions yeah. that you had another. Yeah, book, that'll be a, a pretty thing. deliberate sequel, tentatively titled Beyond the Salvation Wars is uh, the tentative title. Mm. So we'll wow. see how that goes. Wow. Yeah. I've okay. written most of it, actually. So uh, it's it, that one's quite quite a ways along. Actually, speaking of routines, as we before we wrap up, like what's your writing routine? Do you like write in the morning in a few hours or how do you how do you do things? Just uh, Yeah, on my non teaching days. Uh, yeah, usually come in early to the office and write as long as I can stand it. So, okay. Yeah. Great. Well, again, thank you so much just for uh, taking your time out today to uh, just share a few things about the gospel and your, the latest book that you've written. I think it's definitely uh, going to bless many people. I think that uh, you, you, you started out with a very theological version, if you will, scholarly, and then uh, brought it down to, you know, a wider population and then uh, you have the more mass market uh, book in a good way, if you will, that gets to more people. I think it's definitely going to do that. I hope for so. those not aware, this one's about 100 pages. You know, uh, the pages are not very, the words are not very small. You know, it's, it's pretty good. Yeah, it's a fast read. I it's mean, it's about read. a fifth the length of Gospel Allegiance, even though like you wouldn't know it by looking at the covers. But yeah, that one's about five times longer than uh, the Gospel Precisely. Yeah, so this, this is one, one is number four. I think isn't there aren't there like isn't there another one? It's a, like it's a series. Yeah, Renew uh, Renew dot org is putting out a series of books, and so it's the fourth in the series. Yeah, but um, different authors are doing different ones. So I yeah, mine was the the Gospel. Good deal. All right. Well, those of you that uh, had a chance. <clears throat> excuse me, to watch this episode, please uh, consider clicking like and subscribing to the channel. And as noted, this is uh, Dr. Matt Bates. Definitely check out his books and his podcasts. Thanks so much for your time. Thank you.